I uh, was a little older than most of the folks that you've been talking to. Uh, I was in my 30s when I went over there. I had spent four years as a fighter pilot in Europe, a couple of years in school, uh, thanks to the Air Force, and then I was in the space program when the Vietnam War started going, get warming up in 1965. And uh, I was sent to stationed in Japan as a forward air controller, which is the first time I'd heard of that expression. But I was a ground forward air controller. It was not we didn't have airplanes. In nineteen in late nineteen sixty five I was sent to Vietnam with the Korean Marines as a forward air controller. So I spent six months with the Korean Marines and we rapidly found out that we couldn't operate without an airplane. So they checked me out in the 01 in Vietnam. So I had six months as a forward air controller with the Marines. And then I, I was just TDY there, which is temporary duty. And then I went back to Japan. Well, Japan was, um, all the Americans in Japan were all in Vietnam at that time, or most of them. So I uh, volunteered to go back for another tour. And I went through F4 school and spent a year with the, um, in the 8th TAC fighter wing as a F-4 pilot. Came back from that and didn't, I got, it was pretty boring in the civilian world again. So I volunteered again and uh, I went through, uh, I got assigned as a, as a forward air controller. This was in 1969. I went through the FAC training, although I'd been a FAC, they still wanted me to go through their school in Florida, so I went through that. And uh, at that time, I, I had a number of hours of combat in the O-1, but the O-1 was being phased out, and so they put me through the O-2, which is being re replacing the O-1. It was a twin-engine airplane instead of a single-engine, a better airplane. Anyway, uh, so they put me in the O2, and then I went from there to uh, to Vietnam and went into went, uh, got to Saigon, and when they processed me in there, they uh, <coughs> want they asked me if I wanted to volunteer for this program out out of the country, and I said yes, because they told me I'd be able to fly the L the L19, which was what I wanted to do, so that's how I ended up in the Raven. We, I flew to um, Thailand, was in, processed in there, and where all of our I identifications were taken away and put in storage, our flight suits, ID cards, dog tags, everything was put in storage. And we then um, were taken up to Vinchin, where I was processed in there and issued a, a low driver's license, which was my only ID. I was there to be a forward air controller. And um, one of the reasons I, I, I volunteered, because I'd, I'd worked with the Ravens before as an F-4 pilot, but I, I knew they were American, but I thought they, I didn't know they were military. I thought they were America. So I sort of knew what it was all about, but not, not in, in great detail. Well, I was in, I was in Vinci, and when I got there, I was met by an old friend from my days in England, Andy Patton. He was the head Raven at the time. So I thought, this is going to be good over here because an old friend of mine. So I spent a couple days in Vinchin, and then uh, we flew up to uh, Longchen in a T-28, which is a little fighter. And uh, we landed up there, and he introduced me to General Vang Pao and the, uh, the uh, ravens that were there. And uh, like I say, I was older than most of them. I was 35 at the time. They were all in their mid-20s. So I was the head raven, uh, the senior raven at, at Longchen. And um, my job there was to supervise the ravens, the other ravens, and to be responsible for, uh, for their operation. And that involved meeting every night with General Vang Pao and his CIA case officer and the Air America representative, and I were representing the ravens. And we discussed what was going to be uh, accomplished the next day what the general had in mind, and I was given his, what his requirements were for air support, and I'd go back to, we had our own house there, the Raven House, and we had a radio operator. It was our only contact with the outside world. And so I'd go back and, and 
relay to the radio operator what kind of uh, air support we wanted the next day, how many airplanes, when, what kind of ordnance we wanted if we had a decision to make. And that was uh, communicated then down to the, the uh, embassy in Vientiane, and the next day the airplane showed up. So that's how I got to be a raven. <laughs> Um, it was, uh, <clears throat> basically we went down to his house about six o'clock in the evening and uh, we were there for dinner. So we would, uh, he also held, kind of held court with uh, his, his own people there. If they had any complaints about anything, they would bring it up to him at that time and he would make, his, make the decision uh, as to whether he would, sometimes he would give them a little bit of money, sometimes he would bring in the you know, if they had a problem like with a husband, they'd bring the husband in, he'd get spoken to and straightened out. Anyway, he, he was the, the chief, and so he, that was the way he handled his people. Very enlightening and did a good job. After that, we met for dinner, and um, uh, the, the style of, of eating was kind of interesting, and everything was served on a, on a big table, and you were issued a spoon. That was all. And so if you want some of the soup, you dip your spoon into the soup and have, a, have some. The other thing we were issued was a tall water glass full of scotch. And that was the only liquid that was available. So we'd have uh, mung food and uh, mostly it was fairly bland. It was okay. But once in a while they'd sneak in something that was hot. And then the only thing you could get to put the fire out was the scotch. So yeah, I learned to drink warm scotch. <laughs> After the meal, we'd go into the, I call it the map room, where we'd, dis we'd discuss, General Bang Pao would discuss what he was going to do the next day. And then we were told what, we were, what our part was going to be. And that's, and this guy, I remember him talking to his people and resolving their issues. But even more so, I think, was his, uh, his actions and his, being a general, he was a great general, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. Well, we'd, uh, like I say, the night before we decided who was going to do what, and so uh, we usually had an, an, an area to go to. I, I had six, roughly six forward air controllers, six facts working for me. So we would some had uh, maybe two or three would go first thing in the morning, and then we'd have another two or three that go later in the day. And we usually flew twice a day, two or three hours at a, at a time. And uh, that would be my decision as to where I wanted them to go. And so we'd cover what, the requirements that the general had. Once we uh, were in the airplane, we'd, I'd go down and meet my, my Robin, my backseater. And uh, we would be off and be gone all day. And we'd, we'd, a, typical, a typical mission would involve going out to a, an area where there were some people on the ground, um, the um, the Hmong had um, they they weren't weren't a lot of um, troops they were small groups and so they would help help be have a, like a an outpost which they would man where they could see the look out for the, the North Vietnamese uh, where they could um, control basically a a, a a route or something they, uh, like a road and they could see from up there and they were there by themselves maybe six or eight uh, Hmong and uh, usually a case officer with them, a CIA case officer. So we go and check with them and they would tell us what they had observed and what they wanted us to do. So we'd, uh, the, the Robin and I would work together to determine what we could y use our air support for. Day off would probably, if you had the full day off, you'd probably uh, go down to Vinchen or even Udarn. We had requirements to Odorn was in Thailand. We had requirements to, uh, most of our maintenance was done down there, so we freq frequently flew down to, to Thailand to either brief people down there or um, bring, the airplane, bring an airplane in for maintenance. So we'd go down and maybe stay a day or two and then come back. Well, I think the, the closest we had, of course, was with our, with our backseater. And, and this is one of the things I remember strongly about my experience there was getting to know the backseater, the robin. And I think it was, was rather unusual because we were, we were very close and we, we flew together. 
and <clears throat> we counted on each other. We each had a, a, a role to play. The, me, the pilot in the front seat, I was responsible for keeping my backseater safe, doing the job, controlling the airstrikes, that kind of thing. The backseater, I counted on him to make sure that he could talk to the people on the ground because I couldn't understand them, I couldn't speak Hmong. And I trusted him to keep me out of trouble, to not do the things I wasn't supposed to do. So if I saw something that looked like it was a good target, I would clear it, basically clear it with the, the guy, the robin in the back. So we depended on each other, which, which really became a, a major bond for us because we were, imp we were important uh, for the safety of each other. And uh, we counted on each other a lot. And it's amazing when you, you get shot at a lot that you learn to, learn to love your companion. Uh, yeah, and it was, it was kind of unusual, but yeah, the one I remember, well, I guess two, but I'll tell you one first. So often we were flying around and we, we drop a lot of bombs or we control the fighters to drop a lot of bombs and nothing much happens. And, um, but one time I was, this was, I was up in the Ban Ban Valley, which was close to the North Vietnamese border. And it was, it was the Route 7 that traveled east-west from North Vietnam into the PDJ it was a major route and there were there were trucks up there sometimes that we could go after. This particular day I was look, just looking and I saw an area which looked like it was some things were stored down there. In other words, it was, there was, I couldn't see anything like a box, but it was sharp edges which looked to me like it was something stored. So we agreed, I'm talking to my, my back here, that this would be a good place to, to drop some bombs. Well, we, we did, and uh, the explosion was so great, I thought it was going to turn me upside down in the airplane. I'd never heard it or experienced anything so big. I, I think we probably hit a, a SAM, surface air missile, and um, it was pretty exciting. It, it, I'd never seen anything, secondary, we call it a secondary explosion, I'd never seen anything like that in my life. It was quite an experience. <laughs> The other one is a, a much shorter one. This was in a T-28. We flew both the O-1 and the T-28. T-28 was a little uh, same thing that the, the, the Hmong pilots flew. So it had, it had uh, machine guns on it. And uh, we also carried rockets to mark our targets. And one day uh, I was on a, setting up a, a, a pass on, for a, a fighter. So I rolled in and fired my, my smoke rocket, and it went out about three feet in front of the airplane and did a 90 degree straight up, and, it hit the, and I hit it with a prop. And uh, it, uh, fortunately, nothing really happened. I got back on the ground. Everything was running fine, so I continued my mission, got back on the ground, and had a little bit of paint from the, from the rocket that had gone through the propeller. Didn't do any other damage. I think what happened is, uh, the rockets had it, they were called folding fin rockets. So as they come, they'd carry them on the wing, and it'd be in a tube. And as they come out of the tube, these fins would, would come out. And I think what happened, the fins, one, half of them came out and the other half didn't. And so that's why it went straight up. They were not welcome. So I, you know, Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, because of political reasons, uh, we were not supposed to have military people in Laos. That was the agreement that the government had made. And so um, reporters were just not welcome in there. Anybody that came in to get into Laos, they had to be brought in by, by the, uh, the approval of the embassy, and they just didn't let anybody in there. Well, I, um, I, I said I was, at, I was at Long Chen for six months, and it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty hectic. And, and I quite were, after six months I was burned out and I still had another five months to go. And so I uh, asked to be transferred to a different, a little less hectic area. We'd, we'd been uh, overrun at one point and to go down to Long Chin, or Vin Chin, and stay down there at night. We'd fly up every day. They allowed us to come in and fly missions during the day, but we couldn't stay there overnight. So um, in about May of 19, 
1970, uh, I was transferred to, down to Pak Se, which was in the southern part of Laos, right on the Cambodian border. And it was uh, pretty nice down there, pretty quiet, there wasn't much going on. Unfortunately, my timing was awful because I got there just when the Cambodian ended the war. And so all of a sudden it got busy down, very busy down in that area too. So I spent five, week, uh, five months down there. And um, then I, when I, I came back from there, I was uh, offered to uh, sort of choose my next assignment, and I chose Japan because I'd been up there before. Well, I got as far as Tokyo, heading up to, I uh, asked to go to Misawa, which I've been stationed at before, which is northern Japan. Got as far as Tokyo, and they met me uh, at the airplane, and they said, uh, well, things have changed, and so your assignment to Misawa has been canceled. We're going to close Misawa. So you have your choice. You can go to Kunsan, Korea, or you can stay in Tokyo at the headquarters. Well, having just spent a year in Laos, it's a pretty remote area. I didn't particularly want to go to Kunsan, which is an unaccompanied area. So I, I ended up staying in Tokyo. But I soon got bored with that and uh, ended up going back again for a fourth tour. Back to back to Southeast Asia. My last tour uh, was I was I thought I was going back to be to um, be a Raven, and were, but they couldn't assign me directly to the Ravens. So I talked to a colonel in in Saigon, and he said, "Well, if you can get assigned to Southeast Asia, I can get you back into the Ravens." So I said, "Great." So I signed the best job I could get was Airborne Command Post that we had always worked with, called call sign was Cricket, and which was a bunch of people flying around a big C-130 and, and basically providing coordination with, with Saigon in, locally. And um, so I got, got into uh, Karat, Thailand, signed to the, uh, this is called ABCCC, Airborne Command and Control. Uh, and, um, so I called my colonel down in Saigon. Well, he's, uh, the guy who answered the phone says, oh, Colonel so-and-so just rotated last week. And I knew I was in deep trouble at that point. And one year later, I finished my tour at ABCCC and went back to the States and retired. Well, certainly uh, the action, action part, uh, I think the uh, the relationships between ourselves and the Hmong people were very close. And I talked a little bit about with the, with the um, backseater, the robin. But we were also, we were living in town, and we didn't have a lot of contact with the local people. Um, matter of fact, we were told that uh, we were not to have much contact. We'd, we'd see them in town. But there was no, there were no bars or restaurants or anything like that, so we didn't have a social contact with them, except once in a while, a a bossy or something that was organized by General Lang Pao, where we'd get to meet some of the wives and that kind of thing. So we did have some of that, but we just thought that the Hmong were such gentle people that they were just nice, and we really learned to appreciate them. And I think that that aspect of it should, if it was going to be a movie, that ought to be included. Well, I think they should know why we were there. I, I dabbled in a little bit as to why it was secret, but the reason we were there was basically to support the, the, uh, the Laotian people. The, um, I think you probably have already covered this, but the, before, uh, as the Southeast Asia was just warming up, there were three factions in, in the Lao uh, government. There was the, the Royalists, the communists and the neutralists, so three three different factions, and they didn't get along very well with each other. Um, the 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 communists were called the Path at Lao, and they were basically who we were in there to support. We were supporting the um, the royalists, and um, Air America was there to provide them with logistics, and we were there primarily to help give them air support and make sure they didn't, we didn't hurt the good guys instead of the bad guys. So that's what a forward air controller's job is. And so that's why we were there. 
Well, what the first thing that happened was they, um, there was a small strip, dirt strip, out on the edge of the Bullvance Plateau, which is about 40 miles from, from Poxe, and we used that as a staging base. We'd, we'd fly in there and it, um, 55 gallon drums of fuel and rockets in there so we could rearm and refuel in there, close to where, we are, where most of our operations were. Well, there was a, one day I was in there and there was a, a C-47, which was a DC-3, came in with a Thai pilot, a single pilot, this is a big airplane, landing on his dirt strip and he is bringing Cambodian troops in for training. So they were training him in, in Laos at this place. And this, this and, or, and he would land at night and there was no lights or anything. To, I was very impressed with that, that he could do that. So and that was my first realization that, that there was, that Cambodia was getting involved in the war. Well, we didn't have, a, didn't have a, uh, any agreement that we had made to stay out of there. The solution, you know, the reason we got into that in, in Laos was that all the, the Soviets, the Russians, the Chinese, everybody agreed that all the military would come out. Well, everybody did except the North Vietnamese. They left their people there. And uh, one of the interesting things of that crazy operation was that in Vinh Chien, there were um, Chinese communists there. There were Russians there. There were Pasat Laos in town. They had, an, they had a compound there. And you'd go out in the evening to, for a bar, into a bar and be drinking, and there might be a guy next to you who might be Russian or Chinese communist or even pass it loud. We're all just drinking together. That's at night. During the day, we go out and shoot at each other. That was well, I'm, I'm proud of what, what I did over there and what, what, what the U.S. did. We did the right thing. Um, we were basically helping the, helping the, the, Lao, the Lao people. There's a couple other instances I might bring up that sounded kind of interesting. While I was in Pax A, we had to, the Pasat Lao were there, but there were some North Vietnamese troops there too, and they weren't very popular with the Pasat Lao because they, this is their country, and North Vietnamese were foreign. And I've been out, I was out flying around, and I heard somebody calling up on the radio asking for air support, and my backseater, my Robin, said, "That's a Pasat Lao." And he's asking for air support against the North, probably against North Vietnamese. So he looked at where they wanted us to bomb. He said, "I think we ought to do it." We did. I'd be happy to support the Passat Lao against the North Vietnamese. Um, there's uh, something else I was going to mention. Oh yeah, um, the, the Hmong, the Hmong people, and why they were so valuable to us, to the our support of the of the of the Royal Lao forces. Royal Lao forces were good, but they had their problems, political problems. Um, and the Hmong, who were originally from China, uh, had migrated into northern Laos and around the PDJ. And um, they were very unhappy that the North Vietnamese were coming into their land to and, and uh, so they were more than happy to fight them. They, they wanted to fight the North Vietnamese. And so we basically helped them do that. We, we provide the uh, logistic support through Air America. We provide the Air Force, uh, air support through the Air Force and, uh, and the Ravens to help them along. That's what they wanted to do. And of course, General Vang Pao was a fantastic general, real asset. I think one of the one of the ones was uh, actually after my time, when Long Chin was about to be overrun. Uh, they had people in on Skyline Ridge, and it was getting very close to the. And the North Vietnamese had had taken the PDJ back from Vang Pao, and um, he, uh, General Vang Pao, said that he wanted to take some of his troops and put, put them back into the PDJ to put some pressure on the North Vietnamese because they were off there in these mountains with nobody looking in back of them. 
and he felt that if he could go in there and create another front, you know, maybe a big front, you know, with a few dozen troops, that he could create enough uncertainty that they would pull back from from Long Chen. He was told by the U.S. that he wasn't to do that, but he did it anyway, and it was successful. They, started, they saved Long Chen for at that time. When we started to put some folks in up there on the PDJ at the back of these people who were threatening Long Chen, they didn't like having any kind of action in, in, in behind them, so they, they pulled back from Long Chen and saved, saved the city. So I, that's, he was being a good general. Right?